So welcome, Jordan, to the show. It's such a pleasure to have you here today. I have been looking forward to connecting with you since the moment when I started watching your YouTube videos and your Instagram videos. You are, I think, the only other man be besides my dad and my, well, two, you're the third man, besides my dad, my husband, that has made me cry, that has touched my soul because of your golden, authentic heart. So welcome, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you so much. I owe it to my mom. That's you it. Know, that's great. That's great. So tell us a little bit of, when you say I owe it to my mom. Tell us a little bit about your life story and your mission and all the incredible things that you're doing for the youth and not just the youth. You're doing it for moms like me, which is, you know, and grandmothers as well. You are an earth angel. Yeah. So, so my life, so I struggle a lot in school and when you struggle a lot in school, usually most of the time, the one who's kind of right next to you is your mom, you know, and she's the one going to the school meeting. She's the one, you know, pushing you, annoying you, making me do my homework, just all the things like I didn't want to do because I was having such a hard time in school. And my mom became like my target, you know, because like when you struggle and things are hard, the one that loves you the most is always right there. They're just right in your face. They're right there. They can see who they know. They see your potential. And they don't want you to waste it. And my mom is relentless like that. She is so relentless. It's insane. I never seen her like my mom. She just doesn't stop. Right. Doesn't stop. Doesn't matter what time it is. <laughs> she just doesn't stop. And I used to think it was so annoying. And when looking back, like in my life, like I would struggle. Right. And. I would give up on myself and I would get frustrated and my mom didn't know what to do. And I, I remember my mom like trying to figure out what to do with me. And she would just bring me to all different psychologists, all different doctors. And I would sit there and they would just give me these, you know, they would give, they would, they would, they would give me like labels of ideas of what they think, you know, what they think is, um, you know, going on. And as a mom or a parent, like you go to doctors because you, you want an answer. You want to help your kids. And my mom was doing that. So like every time I'll go to a new doctor, it would be a new diagnosis. Everything would be new. And they would try all these different techniques, all these different things. But I was just so angry with myself, with how I felt in school, with my self-esteem. A lot of things about it. I didn't like that I was so short. I was always I was so short. My, my twin brother was taller than me. You know, I would always ask my mom, when am I getting my growth spur? When am I getting my growth? She would just tell me it's coming. It's coming. And like, I used to really think it was coming. And um, it never really came. And I would just like, every, everything bothered me, right? And then I would go to school and I would be lost. I'd have anxiety. I couldn't get on the school bus. I missed so much school in sixth grade. I would jump out of my mom's car on the way to school. I would just run. I would run away from home. Like every time I got close enough to that driveway of the school, just like I would have this anxiety attack. I just couldn't oh. go back to this place where I was like so lost. And I felt like, like the only way I could describe it is I would sit in class and I'd be like, I want to, I want to learn like everyone else. I would sit there and then like, I would, they'd be on like a chapter one. I'd be like, all right, chapter one. I get it. I know what he's saying. But I don't really know what he's saying. And then it would just be like, you know, like a balloon and you're watching it just get further and further away in the sky. I mean, and it would just yeah. go away. And then all of a sudden they'd be on chapter like five and I'm trying to figure out chapter one. I'm like, how am I going to do this? And everyone would raise their hand. Everyone know the answer. Like, I would just like, never, ever felt like I got anything. And it just took a toll on my self-esteem, my self-worth and my frustration. And it just led to like everything else. And then just, just led to me just like, just being angry, wanting to get in trouble, wanting to make bad choices, wanting to just disregard anything my mom said. And my mom became like my biggest enemy for, for 18 years. And, um, it was hard. It was really hard. You know, I, I, I went to, they, they tried to help me. They brought, they sent me to a private school, all boys school. <laughs> They thought it would be a clean slate. Nobody would know me as the kid that just, you know, I felt like everyone knew me as the kid in the resource room and everyone knew me that as that way. And I hated it. And I thought if I went to this new high school, I'd be a regular kid. No one would know me like that. And I remember going there and I just was so lost again. And I had a really bad experience with the teacher and I failed out. I failed out. I stopped going. And that's when I went back to public school and my mom would fill my book bag up every morning and I would dump it out in the garage, go to school, put my hood up, get a chocolate muffin, get it, get it, get a, a Snapple. When I got to school, eat it in the back, put my headphones on. I was a Walkman at the time. This was 2000, yeah. 2000 this was 2004, 2005. I would listen to Linkin Park. I love Linkin Park. My favorite band. 
it was their the hybrid theory um album it was the song run away and i would go to school listen to the song run away because i want every word that song said was like my life i wanted to run away from my life i wanted to run away from home and it just made me feel like this song was like talking to me and I would just listen to it every day in school. And then I would run away from home. I, I wouldn't go to school. I'd run away into the woods. I would do whatever I can. And this hat just went on for four years. And I just didn't, uh, you know, I didn't like have, I didn't, I felt like I was just like nothing. I felt like a nothing. I felt like I had a 1.7 GPA. I never passed an assignment on my own. I did place, I wrestled. So I wrestled in school that like gave me somewhat of a purpose because I was never good at anything, but I was good at wrestling to a certain point because I was smaller. I was, I was, I was, I was angry. So I took my anger out, like when I wrestled and I was able to like kind of channel that, like my ADHD and all my energy into that. But I didn't work hard in school. I didn't work hard at wrestling. I was just like this angry kid inside my own head. And I just wrestled. And that gave me like a little bit sense of like purpose, but it, but how I felt about myself really kind of carried over into wrestling. You know what I mean? I never, and my mom was like my biggest fan. She would, she signed me up to all these special clubs. I wouldn't go. I would be angry. Like, and I was a, naturally a good wrestler. I was good. Like I was naturally, my mom said, Jordan, you're so good. You could be great. You just got to run. Like I wouldn't even run. I wouldn't lift weights. I did nothing to help myself. And she would always like cheer me on. And I, and I ended up winning a lot of matches. I was a district champ. I did all these things that like good wrestlers do, but when it came down to beat the guys that were, you know, the state champion, state level, I lost because I wasn't putting the work in. And my mom would always annoy me. She would put me in the car, drive me all the way to Butler, New Jersey. And like nights I wouldn't want to go and I wouldn't get in the car. I wouldn't even talk to my mom. Um, and she would say, she would always tell me how great of a wrestler I was. You know, she was always just like building me up, building me up. But I didn't listen. And senior year came, no college would accept me. Nobody would give me a chance. I had a SAT score was very bad. I had a very low GPA, 1.7 GPA, never passed anything, no clubs, no nothing. I had this wrestling thing that I did, but nobody would give me a chance, no school. It, and, and we applied to every college, like everywhere. Every I, I would come home, my brother would get in, I didn't get in. My brother would get in, I didn't get in. And it hurt. I just wanted to be accepted. You know, I didn't really want to go to college. I didn't know what a major was. I didn't know anything. I didn't even know how to do anything. And um, I never like I never like did anything. So I, I was like, I can't go to college. I can't even do this. Um, but I'll never forget it. We went to a meeting with the child study team, with my mom. And the head of the child study team looked at my mom and said, don't set yourself up for a heartbreak. Jordan cannot go to a four-year college. And I remember hearing that and – when you struggle, when you're a kid and you struggle, you want to hear that. That justifies why you can't do it. And I was like, she's right about me. I, I can't go. That, 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 everything that makes sense now. But then my mom was like, no, he's going. I know he needs to go change his life. He just needs to be in the right, with the right program, with the right, with the right people that believe in him. He needs to go, go somewhere where he can just change his life. And I chose to listen to that woman instead of my mom, who was like making my life limitless. And this woman who was putting limits on my life, just judging me. I did an IQ test on there in, in my senior year. Like, you know, those IQ tests they give you. And like, I'm a bad test taker. I'm like, I really am. And they ask you all these weird questions, like whatever, whatever is an IQ, yeah. like, whatever, you know? And they're asking me like questions, like word problems, like a rubber band is, I'm like, you know, nothing. The guy says, nothing's wrong. Just answer it. And then he's like, that he's like, I'm like, I'm looking at him. Like, is that right? He's like, good answer. I'm like, this is crazy, whatever. And I'm just answering these questions, but I'm really trying to answer them. Like I'm trying and then they're like, read, you know, read these words up a line. And when you can't read anymore, stop. So like, I would try to read. I'm a bad reader. I, I, I'm, I'm dyslexic. It's hard. Everything was hard in that test. My IQ score was so low. They called my mom. We're like, we're, you know, we're so, we're scared for him, you know, for his future. And my mm -hmm. mom came to me and she was like, Jordan, I've never, she was like crying almost. And she said, Jordan, please tell me you didn't try. And I saw the worry on my mom's eyes. And I said, I didn't try because I didn't want her to be so nervous for me that I, and I, and I, and I noticed that so I said, I didn't try mom. Don't worry about it. But I really did try. And I remember going back to my room going, man, I must be in bad shape here. In my, you know, cause I was a kid. I didn't know. And I'll never forget. I, I, I did got denied from every school. I applied to centenary. This guidance counselor said, Jordan, give this one last school a chance. You've been denied everywhere. Just do it. I said, you fill it out. I'll hit enter. He said, fine. So he filled out the common app. I hit enter. I left the school. I got suspended the second to last day of senior year. And 
we got a letter in the mail and I got in to Centenary College. But my mom drove to that school every day when I sent the application and begged them to accept me. My mom annoyed them until they let me in because I on paper I shouldn't have got in. And that was the that was the beginning of my life. That oh. changed my life right there. It was crazy. You 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 were ready, you were making me cry again because <laughs> that your it's not even a story it's your journey it's your journey and your journey is really like it's from um it's not even surviving it's it's to thriving and um it's it's every single child every single person on this on this earth the number one thing that everyone desires most is to be loved and to be accepted to be heard and when there is this stigma of and the labels of you have ADHD, you have this, you have, you're on the spectrum, you are, you know, all these labels, it sets so many limitations. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? It's, it sets these limitations, when in reality, the number one thing that your mom did as a parent, which was she never gave up on you, that's number one. And the fact that she was relentless, that she didn't take no for an answer. She saw the potential, your highest potential, and that every single person on this planet Earth has a specific gift that they came here to share. When um, when you were a child, like um, growing up, you have a brother, you have a sister, right? Yeah, yeah, a twin brother and a sister. How My old? sister's 16, 16 months younger, so we were like triplets. We were all close. Oh, wow. It was crazy. My mom had a crazy house. Oh, my God. God bless. God bless your mom. But how old were you when you felt that you were, quote unquote, different than the other kids? It was probably like sixth grade. We were learning. I mean, I'm sorry, sixth, mm -hmm. second grade. We were learning at uh -oh. tell time. And um, I couldn't, you know, I still mess up with it. You know, I said a quarter to two. I'm like quarter to two. I'm like, just tell me the real thing. Just to say, say two 30. I'm, you know, I hate, I hate it. I, I always got confused. They're, they would, they would tell you all these things. And we had these fake plastic clocks, you know, and I was sitting in class and I couldn't do it. Like I just couldn't get it. Everyone else just kept doing it. Everyone was getting done. I remember sitting there and I got called up to the front of the class by this old school teacher. And she said to me, are you, are you deaf or are you dumb? Pick one. Right. And she kept asking me in front of the class. And I remember sitting there and I'm like, well, I know I'm not deaf. Right. Cause I could hear her and I'm like, but I don't want to be dumb. And like, so I'm like, but I'm not deaf. So like, I remember just saying I'm dumb, you know, and then she'll sit down, you know? And then that's when I realized like, it wasn't what she did, What she did was just like mean for a little kid, but like, mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out that telling time. And then it was the next grade reading out loud. And I noticed how I sounded reading out loud compared to everyone else. I couldn't like get through the sentences. I didn't sound right. And I felt I, that's when I first started to get nervous reading out loud. And I started to really notice that. And my mom noticed it. But my mom would always tell me, like, Jordan, you have charisma. You have you you have some special ability about you. Like, you, you, you she would always talk about the good things about me, right? She never, like, brought this stuff up. But she would always look for people to help me, like tutors and, you know, psychologists. And someone, you know, always had looking for the resources. But she would always tell me the good things about me. But I just said, you're just my mom. That's why you're saying that, you know, about me. And uh, but she always say, you have something special about you. You have charisma, you know, that's something that you can't buy. And 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 you have that. So so don't worry, you know. And I, I remembered that. It gave me a little bit of hope, you know, during these times. But it was really like second grade and until I was 18, you know, it was really it was really a hard, hard Hard road, you know, it was a, we, we've been through a lot. My mom, my mom has been to a ton of doctors. I mean, we had nights where we had to, you know, we went to some hospitals, you know, I was trying to run away. I was so frustrated. You know, everything was just like, just such a, just a wild road of emotions because, you know, you're, you're so young, you don't understand, you're going through so much changing, you're trying to fit in, kids say things. It's just was like this tornado of like, like, I thought I was just never going to make it. Like, I would see my dad go to work and I would be like, I'm never going to be able to go to work like my dad. Like, I just thought I couldn't do anything. And I would just say that, like, young, a young kid, I would see my dad going to work in the morning with, like, his tie on. And I would say, I'm never going to be able to do that. Like, I'd never, I'm never going to do anything because I can't do school. And when you're a kid, the only sign of, like, success is school. It's, it's just, that's it. Wow. So if you're not good in school, right, what, what else, where else can you succeed? Like where, where, where else can you see some type of um, success? You, like I couldn't see it. So it, it, it was tough. It was a tough road. 
and as and as like a growing adolescent and trying to find your identity during the time of like okay second grade and then middle school middle school there is not one person on this planet earth that can say middle school were the best three years of my life it's the total freaking opposite because middle school is is hormonal changes when people go when when the kids go through puberty who am i i'm not a i'm not a kid i'm not i'm not an adult i'm not a teenager and now with all of these like i don't want to say they're stupid distractions but i feel like these things it's like a form of hypnosis you know like there's a lot of positive things that's the way i found you right but then there's also a lot of like of um of the focus on on the wrong things of the material right right of like, oh, you got the, the great the great sneakers. Oh, you have this. Oh, look, this person has that car. I have no, it's like the comparison thing. And then they lose sight. It just feels like um, even brain activity. Now, when, at least when I was younger, I didn't have a cell phone, obviously. Um, I'm, I'm, I think 10 or 15 years older than you, but it's like, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up with that at all. We had to, we had to spend that time that even when we left school, even if we had a really bad day, we at least were able to disconnect in a sense where now whatever happens in school, you're still connected. That thread, that web, like if the kids, if you feel insecure, the other kids, they read energy, they can feel it. And that right. bullying or that judgment it comes home with you. And I feel like now more than ever, the world, the youth, they need people like you to share the truth, to share the authentic, like the, your your authenticity, the good, the bad, the ugly, and to help them eradicate that voice of judgment. Just like that teacher, when that teacher said, are you dumb or are you blind or deaf, whatever it is, a teacher, just because the, the name is teacher or coach, doesn't make them a person of integrity. It's their projection. It's stupid emotional manipulation. And, um, but that judgment lasts that seed until adulthood. Some like I'm, I'm a therapist. Like I do, I'm working with adults sometimes helping them with those of the teacher or the coach or the parent or the word that was the trigger that made them feel less than you know like yeah. it, it's it's crazy and it, it, it comes back it's like dormant like even like yeah, it like wakes what up happens, yeah it can come like even now like when i go sign my book for all the kids at the end like when i'm speaking i i'm a bad speller i've never been a good speller i can't spell i never if, if you're not a good speller you're not a good speller i'm not i didn't go practice being good a speller it was it you know i just i can't yeah. spell good so so when I write, I sign it and I always ask the kids their names. And I always ask them how to spell it. Like every name I can't, most names are, are like short names, like Kim, Sam. I like those. I can spell those. But when they get, when you start saying like Eleanor and Mackenzie, I was, Rachel, I spell them wrong. Right. I mess them up. So I'm like, spell it for me. Spell it. But when I'm, when, when I ask them, like I ask them, but in like internally, when I do it, I don't care about it anymore, but it comes back like the old Jordan, like the one that like would read and like wouldn't be able to sound out the words. And I would be so nervous. Like, I can't, I feel like this big, even though now in my life, like I've done so much, it doesn't matter. Like it still comes back. That teacher, those comments, those feelings, they're still there. But what I try to tell the kids, I'm like, yeah, you do that feeling, right. Is actually your advantage, right? That's your advantage against everyone else. Right. That's the feeling like, who are you on the hard days? Right. The, everyone's good on the good days, but on the hard days, when you get those feelings and you show up, you work hard, that's what's going to take you to the, to the next level. So, you know, I try to embrace those feelings now and be like, all right, that those feelings that I had, I thought were, you know, a disadvantage in my life, but really they're the advantage in my life. They were the reason why that I am now able to, you know, Hey, a hundred doors can close in my face. I don't feel it. You know, that I, I failed everything in my whole life. So what, you know, I'll take any risk. I'll take any chance. I don't care what goes down uh, or whatever, you know? And, and that's what I want the kids to understand. Like we're nothing without our mistakes, right? We all make mistakes. So if you think that someone's going to write the, the most perfect book with no errors or a paper, it's not true, you know? So, you know, I spell things bad. I hear things. I, I hear things when someone says something like not all the time, but I'll catch it. Someone will say something and I, I will be walking on there. I remember the first time happening in high school, I was walking away and it literally hit my brain like four seconds later. Like I heard them 
they didn't hear him. And then it went boom. I go, oh, it was like it like it got stuck in time. It was so weird. Like something like my like I process things a little bit slower, a little bit. But like like I remember walking away, and after I walked away from that person, then I heard it. So I'm like, wow. And I try to like focus on that now. I'm like, I'm like, all right. I know it's gonna like I know it's gonna get here, but I gotta just kind of let's like don't let's stay in the game. You know, we gotta. I got it's gotta. I gotta find it. You know, it was wild. It's so wild, it's, um, but. But your processing is not slower. Your processing is actually, there's a depth to it. And, you know, there's a depth to it because when it's it's like the frequency of time and space, in a sense, does time and space really exist, right? It's, you know, when when you are, those those things that you that they that say that they say are detriments or failures, when in reality, it's just a stepping stone to who you are today. Um, those challenges, other senses that are within you get awakened. So the processing of even of what you heard four seconds later, maybe the person that heard it that moment would not feel the whole essence of what that meant, you know? And it's, it's, it's really, I'm, I'm so impressed by you and your courage as well for, especially for it's you, you, you do represent the divine masculine. I need to say that because it's it's helping not only young men and girls, but you help so many feel comfortable in being true to their emotions, especially nowadays. Like if we, if we, if every single school would start teaching like EQ and mindfulness and kindness, like in the curriculum, just like as math and science, like it's school is not for everyone, like those kind of subjects. But kindness and emotions, the world would be a better place. And oh, the, yeah. way that, the way that you teach about it's okay to feel, but to to let them to let people know these young kids that they're not alone. They are not alone because, like I mentioned before, everybody wants to be accepted and loved. And at this age, especially, I have a sixteen-year-old boy and I have a nineteen-year-old girl, but. It's hard being a mom of a boy who is like, he's a, he's a man sort of, but not really a man yet. Right. Right. And, um, he feels he's sensitive, but yet he wants to be tough and yet he rejects his mom. So when you, when I hear stories between you, the way you describe your mom, I always thought I was going to be that cool mom. And my son's going to be like, you know, like telling me everything. I am so not the cool mom. I need my own EQ class, even though I teach it, but I need, I need a Jordan in my life to help me. Yeah. But I, I tell the moms all the time. I say, listen, they act like they don't hear you. They act like they're not listening when they need to hear you the most, they will hear everything that you said to them. So like, you can't, the, like I was waiting for my mom to give up on me and she wouldn't, if my mom gave up on me, I would have gave up. I know I would have stopped but she just wouldn't like, I needed that. So like, I tell the moms that like, they're waiting for you to give up, but they also hear you. So like right now you think they don't hear you get away from me, mom. Like my mom used to, I used to lock my door that morning going to college. My mom um, took the credit card, popped open my door. I, I locked my door that night. Cause I didn't want them to take me to college. My mom didn't care. She was like, I'm getting the car, you know? And the, I used to jump out of my mom's car. I was 18 years, 17 years old going up to college. I sat in the back seat. I was acting normal because my mom, I was like, all right, I'll get to the highway and I'll jump out of the car. They won't be able to catch me and they'll go up 287 and I'll run and they won't be able to get me. And right when I went to go pull the handle, they put the child lock on because they knew that I did that. And I didn't realize they were two steps ahead of me. My mom knew me better than I thought I was going to trick my mom. And the child lock was on. I was stuck in the car and I, my mom took me to a place where I thought I was gonna, that was going to ruin me. But really it was a place that, that, that where I found myself in. When I got there, I'll never forget it. I was crying in my dorm room. My parents left me there. I was I I told my mom how much I hated her in the rearview mirror in the back of the car. I got there. I looked at her. I said, "You better not leave me here." I'm sitting in orientation. It's a summer school program. It's the only way I was allowed to go to this college was summer school. It was you know this is the time you wake up. This is the time you go to bed. This is the time you go to your tutor. This is the time you go to your social worker. Lights out tutor lights like it was perfect schedule of like wow. there was no time to do anything just it was school class tutor library everything i went they left me there i went in my room i started to cry i had an anxiety attack i walked out ran to the bathroom all my 
feelings came back. Like every time I got to this moment, I quit on myself in school, at the bus stop, at the stop sign, walking into the class. Every time I like raging, I always quit. And right, I was looking at myself crying. And I remember this looking at my face in the mirror. And I hated what I saw. And I hated this feeling. And I just said to myself, like, what if my mom is right? I just said that to myself. I was just so angry at my mom, but I said it. And I started to hear all the things my mom was telling me, like my whole life, all the good things, not not that like everything I thought was annoying. I started to hear it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. I never, but I'm going to do, I shut the lights off. I threw water on my face. I had long hair, like real long hair at the time. And I went to my, <laughs> Lincoln, and I had, Park. Lincoln Park. Yeah. It was Lincoln Park. I was in my Lincoln Park <laughs> stage. I had puka shell necklaces on. I went to my room. <laughs> I set my alarm and I woke up that morning and I sat in the front of the classroom for the first time ever that week. I passed my first assignment ever in my life. And I graduated that program with a th a three a four point oh. I went there with a one point seven. I graduated that summer with a four point oh. They took my phone. I didn't have a phone. It was eight weeks later. I after I won this award, I won a four point oh, and then I won this hardest worker award. After I got off the gazebo, it was like this picnic thing. I said to Derek, "Give me your phone." I call my mom. Right, the person who I hated the most. Right, I called my. I said, "Mom, I got a four point oh, and I won the hardest worker." She always started crying on the phone. She couldn't believe it. And that was like when I realized I'm like, my mom was right. Like my mom was right about me. I was wrong about me and I hated my mom for being so right about me, but she was right. And that's when I said to myself, I got, when I need a confidence booster, like I got to listen to my mom because my mom, my mom could see it, even though I can right now, but my mom can. And I would, and I used it. And ever since then, that's, that was like the foundation of like everything in my life. And that's why, you know, I'm, that was when I was 18. Now I'm 34, but like my video was like, I would have never got to the point of understanding that if I my mom didn't take me and throw me into like the the lion's den and said like I know who you're gonna become, do you know? It's I'm I know you hate me right now, but I'm taking the risk because I love you that much. You know, go 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 be who I know you can become. And like she did not care how much I fought with her, how much I, I mean I was I I was just as relentless as my mom, you know. But she was just topping me and. um I tell the moms, you gotta, you gotta match it, you know, because they're going to break out of this and they'll never look back and go, mom, you were, you were too much. You know, they will say, mom, I needed it. Right. You never find the kids now. Like, oh, my mom was the mom that always said yes to everything. Yes. to sleepovers. Yes. to going out. Who cares what time you come home? They don't want that mom. They think they want that mom. That's not the mom that they, you really want. And when they get older, they realize like the difference. And that's, that's why, you know, I, I came to this understanding wow. So like, and like, and I, I never would, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be who I am if my mom just let me sit on my deck and listen to Lincoln Park. Cause that's what I would do. I would sit on my deck and outside in the sun, just hanging out, listening to my music and ignoring my mom. And she would come over, pull my earphones out, you know, it just, so, so like it was, you know, I, 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 I give my mom all the credit. So I tell the moms, you know, don't give up because they're, they're waiting for it. You know, they're waiting for you to give, they're waiting for it. No, they are, especially like, you know, being a therapist in the work I work, I, I teach a Stanford University mindfulness program to children, to teenagers, to adults, corporate. Um, I'm in, in, in the realm of energy healing work, but I also live in the quote unquote real life, married for many years, rearing children and parenthood. There's, there is no book. You could read many books, but every soul is different and everyone has their own magic. Like I'm looking at your shirt and I see the stars, like every single person has their own magic that they need to discover. And the, the path of self-discovery is failure, but I'll never forget. And this is one thing that I think you learn being a parent. You're trying to find your equilibrium at the same time. You have to, you have to know, do not during teenage years, don't take anything personally. Actually, it's one of the four agreements in Don Miguel Ruiz's book, The Four Agreements. Number one, don't take anything personally. When people react, it's their projection of their own insecurities, right? right. So be, my husband traveled a lot. He's in the fashion industry. And I was alone with the kids a lot um, when they were younger. I think only when COVID hit was when the first time that me and James were like together every single day. And it was great. But those times when he wasn't, he was absent from the home because of work and I was rearing the kids and I was tired. I was working and as I was working, doing my, what I'm passionate about, 
but also trying to be the best mom I could be. And my kids are three years apart and they would fight, even though they are girl, girl and boy, they would fight like dog and cat, like all the time, like fight. They both, I tried to do things that both um, boys and girls can do. So they did Taekwondo, Taekwondo, they did flag football together because I couldn't split them up. And luckily I had a daughter that liked like that, you know, um, warrior sports, which was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was awesome. And when they would fight and my, I would, I would say, that's it. I'm taking your DS. Remember the DS? I'm yeah. Taking, yes. You're not, I'm taking it for like, when we're angry as parents, I'm like, I'm taking it away for two weeks. Like I would say some, and then later on to like two days later, like Mikey would come and he's like, mom, could I have my DS back? And I'm like, no, I said two weeks. And he's like, come on, I was good. And I would take it and I would give it back. Okay. Right. First of all, lesson learned, never say two weeks. If it's like, kind of like try to find that middle ground where you could follow through because after that, that behavior still continued where like, because there was, there wasn't really of consequences in that sense. He's like, oh, well I could always negotiate and she'll, she'll just give me my, my stuff back. And she, he told me at a very young age, she was 11 years old. And he said, mom, you need to be, he said, I need to be more like dad in this sense. If you don't say, like he told me, he goes, if you say two weeks, you have, you have to be like dad and actually not give me back my stuff for two weeks. He wanted me to right. actually be that strict parent, not right. of my bark was bigger than my bite. Right. Like he did not, like, I would just go crazy and then give it back once, you know, and so I love how your mom really did whatever it, it took, even behind the scenes when you didn't even know and you were mean to her. Like Mike also tried, he jumped out of cars. Before. I have my child lock. He, there were moments of that. <laughs> and there were moments of that when I threw my kids out of the car too. This my right. said mom too. I would, I'm like, get out in the middle of a pouring rain. So yeah, yeah. we're doing the best that, that we can. But what is your advice to like parents who are trying to find like the the middle ground in a sense of they knowing that their kid is struggling with with identity emotions acceptance like what would be the greatest advice that you could give a parent so when it comes to that i think that the best number one like you said before all their anger right it's true you cannot take it personal so you got to stay calm because i remember if my mom stayed calm I, I, your kids are just trying to figure this out and they're frustrated. They're full of anxiety. If you match that kind of like anger and yelling and frustration, it makes everything worse for, for the kid. It, it made it worse for me. Like if my dad would start yelling, my mom, and it would like, it would make everything crazy. The best thing I would say to you is you got to stay calm. You got to stay calm. You got to really put your, your mind where they're at. You got to go there, you know, and you got to understand like, this is not personal. They're trying to figure out. They're frustrated. They're lost. They don't hate you, right? But you got to let them know and you got to tell them, listen, you got to remind them every single day of all the good things about them, all the things that maybe they can't see. And you got to keep telling them that because it's repetitive. Where they're struggling every single day, they're seeing it. And if you're not matching that with all the things that are there, things that are good at, maybe they're good. Maybe they're good at, maybe they're like really good at building Legos, right? But they're really bad at math and they're failing math. And they're angry about it. And they're frustrated and they're getting into trouble. But but look what they're building with Legos and you tell them like, don't listen. I don't need you to be the best at algebra. I don't need you to be the best mm -hmm. at spelling. Right. But I need you to work your hardest there. Work just work your hardest because your gifts, right. Are, are here. Look what you did. Right. That the kids in class that are doing good at algebra, maybe can't build this or maybe can't draw that. Right. So, right. but if you work hard at the things that are hard for you and you apply that same effort at, to your gifts, that is going to make the difference. You're not going to take, your algebra with you later. You're going to take who you become to get through algebra and kind of speak to them in a way where don't take the pressure off your kids of like being like the greatest student, right? We're not it, like, I'm not saying don't care about the grades, but I'm saying like, don't like if your kid's reading level isn't where it should be, it's like, don't, don't, and don't say it to them. Don't say your reading level is a third grade level. Like what, there's no such thing, whatever. Right. My, exactly. I don't even know what my reading level is. I read my son books to bed. I mess up on the words. So my reading level is maybe an infant level. Right. I wrote a book. <laughs> I sold a hundred thousand copies. 
right? So whatever, right? So it doesn't matter. So just like, don't talk about those things, right? Work on them. Say, yeah, those things are hard for you, but 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 that's your gift, right? We're going to work hard here. I got your back. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going to be annoying. I'm going to push you because I know who you're going to have to become and let them know that. And, but, but you got to stay calm when you do it. You got to stay calm. And I know it's hard as a mom. Trust me. I know it. It's very hard to not lose your patience because the kids, you know, they, I was relentless. I know. I just, like when I like see parents and kids, like I know what they're dealing with because I was that kid. And, but if you could stay calm and keep building them up and keep building them up and then put them into activities that, that they do great in, like outside mm. of school. Maybe they're good at rock climbing, go sign up to a rock climbing gym, whatever, like keep it going, you know, keep the confidence and the self-worth building, build your child's self-worth and your self-confidence and their self-belief in themselves. And that will set them free forever. That the, the algebra, the spelling, the math, the SATs, the good colleges, that will never matter if they have self-worth and self-confidence, self-esteem, that is it, that will that's the that's the key and as parents we can do that because you can see only you really like you know other people can see like the gifts in your, in your kids but as the mom and the dad like the parents you can really you know it and if you could just keep driving that to your kids they'll they'll become that they will and everything you'll look back and realize all oh, that little stuff didn't matter you know and the big things matter how they feel about themselves how they look in the mirror and what they see and how they see themselves like that's the stuff they, the parents should do to build up their kids, you know, and it's, 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 it's a happy medium. It's school, right? School's important in a way, but uh, it's not the defining factor of where your success lives at all. It has exactly. nothing really to do with it. So it, but it, but what does define you there is how you work through it because life is just as hard as school in a different way. You're going to get hit with life problems, just like you get hit with algebra problems. Right. And the same way you get through the algebra and the same way you get through you know, trying to find yourself is the same way you can get through your problems in life later. And if we can kind of work on that kind of mindset through this, you know, your, your kids will really have this self-worth and self-confidence be ready for anything. And that's what I, that's what I want the parents to really do with their kids. And that's my message like really to the kids, you know, in a different way to really like, like, let them know, like, it's, it's going to be okay. Right. It's going to be okay. But this yeah. is why it's going to be okay. But I'll tell you, Jordan, I'm going to tell you like some, some hard truths that I've seen on paper, like what you just, what not even on paper from your heart, that's the truth. Like building them with that, with with great self esteem, reminding them of who they are in in the inside. You know the self esteem, the confidence. But what if, what if the parents, you know, like you were so blessed that you had a mother that never gave up on you, never, ever, ever, like me too. Like I will never like till, till the day I die. And there are times where my son is like, stop treating me like a baby. And I'm like, till the day I die, 150 years old, you will always be my baby. You are right, your right. soul. We're all God's children. This is not about religion, but you will forever be my baby, no matter what. But what do you say, like, in terms of, like, if there are some kids that don't come from a home where they're, the mother is in tune with, maybe the mother has mental illness, maybe the mother's checked out, maybe the mother, God forbid, passed away, maybe they're, right, in, right. how do we build up the kids that don't have, like, that warm foundation at home or or that kind of support system like, what if they're drug addict parents? Right, or, right, right. How how do are... how do we get through to those kids? Like, how when there's this system of school, is it's there's there's it's just the resources are so limited sometimes. What it's what hard. what what is the solution there? I mean, the, I so I see it a lot too because I travel the country and I see it. Like, right. there are problems like that. They're real. There's no mom. There's no dad. There's a grandma. There's an aunt. Sometimes there's nobody. Yeah. Right, and that when I go to the schools, and sometimes I just do faculty and I talk to them and I, and I say, you know, you, they might not have anyone in their life, right? Anyone I'm here today. Right. But I'm gone. You guys are here every single day. You guys are, you might be like their mom. You might be like their dad, the guidance yes. counter. You have to per pick up on it as the teacher. Yeah. You're a teacher, but you're also a human and you need to look and see because you have this gift now where you have these kids in your classroom every single day and you can't forget about the kids in the back, the ones that aren't showing up, the ones that yes. look like they maybe they didn't shower, that look they don't have any love at all, that look like something's going on. You can't 
just forget about it because you're having a long day, right? You have to go, hey, come here. You're struggling. What's going on? Like, I got your back. You got to put that belief in them because I know there's good people out there everywhere. And you got to, like, I tell them, you got to grab them. You got to tell them you believe in them. You got to tell them, listen, I got your back. I'm, you're not going to let me down. I'm not going to let you down. And they have to know someone. They have Everybody has someone. No one should be alone. And if they're alone at home, you got to be to someone at school and you got to do it. You got to do it. And I think that's the way, that's the only way to fix that problem is people have to be more self-aware in the classroom, the guidance counselors. You can't just be like so frustrated. Your day was crazy. The kids are being bad, but you got to look beyond the kid that's flipping the desk over or you go beyond it, you know, and that kid is needs you. They need you and you need to pick up on it and you need to act on it. And, and that can, that one moment is saying, Hey, I believe in you can change that kid's whole life. He's never heard it. She's never heard it. Hundred so, like, percent. They got to do it. So when I go to the schools, I talk about that and um, I'm writing my next book on that. I'm writing it. So I'm writing my next book I, and I write all my books. I write my books. I type them and then I publish them. I don't, I don't get, there's no ghostwriter. I don't let anyone mess with my writing. Yeah. I write it. Yeah. And um, I, I know publishers, nothing. I just do it. So I'm writing my next book on that because I want teachers to read it. I want, you know, school systems to read it because I think that can take care of that, you know, group of kids that, like you said, aren't fortunate enough. Like not everyone has mm-hmm. like a mom no. and dad coming home fighting for their kids. And if they don't have that, right, they're, they're like, well, why am I going to fight for myself? But if they get that special teacher, that's, hey, like, they're like, wait a minute, why is this teacher, yeah. this teacher must see something to me, right? Why is she not, or why is he not, you know, letting me, let me like, let me win here, you know? And um, that, 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 that's life changing. So I think that's how we fix it, you know? And I'm going to, I try, when I go to schools, I try to, you know, I push that and I talk about that. So it's important. It is really important, you know, like, Growing up, like my my parents worked a lot. I'm a child of immigrants and it's crazy. My sister and I are 10 years apart. I'm 10 years older and my mom was working. I was, was I don't know, at like age 10, 11, leaving me home with an infant, but they did. Yeah, yeah back <laughs> then. Know, like, that's it. Back then, you kind of like, you know, you're old enough. You're 10 years old. You're two digits. You could babysit. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, right. But I remember like just last week, um, I was at the United Nations and I was it, today, actually, when we're recording, it's not only my son's birthday, but it's also the International Day of Peace. So how cool oh, wow. is that? That's yeah, cool. that, we're, that you and I are connecting. So last week when I was at the UN, I was blessed enough like to to be invited to a beautiful like um, peace. It was a peace day. And it was it was um, a lot of youth were speaking. So as I'm there, who do I see? My high school teacher, okay? And his name is George Anthony. I was in the 10th grade and I was partying or whatever. I was kind of trying to like be a normal kid in a sense. Like I knew I had these extra sensory gifts and learning the conventional way was always so challenging for me. But he was the one teacher when I was in sophomore year that kind of took me under his wing. And his words stayed with me forever. And now, how many years later, right? I see him at the UN. And now he's like, come, I'm on the UN. I'm on the committee. I want you to join this organization. He believed in me when I was a sophomore. There was no, you need that one teacher. Even though my parents, like they were warm people or anything, but they they weren't able to kind of like, I was a free spirit. You know, I was I was a wild child because of the way that my brain was always operating. But I had him there when I was in 10th grade as a catalyst to awaken that in me. And I never in my life would forget that because it's it's not the actual words that he said. It was the emotion that I felt, the feeling that awakened something inside of me that I knew there was something vaster than you know, just Staten Island, you know what I mean? There's a picture and we all have this purpose. So you, you, Jordan, your, your purpose here on planet earth, um, you raise the consciousness of every single person that you come encounter with your words, your essence, your books, whether they're spell checked or not, whatever it is, whatever. Yeah, it's 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 like um it's the golden ticket of reminding people of of their of their magic. Um and just, you know, any last few words that you would 
Well, before we do that, how about this? What advice would a 34-year-old Jordan give to that second grader that couldn't tell time? I would say that, um, you know, that that second grade, I would say, if you can't tell time, that's okay, right? You will eventually figure it out. But you have to keep showing up, right? You have to keep showing up because I believe all of us are really one moment away from really proving it to ourselves. That's the biggest thing. When we prove it to ourselves, when we see it for ourselves, that's when life changes. And if you can keep showing up and if you can keep working hard, even though you're not getting it, even though you don't understand it, but you're just there and you're not, and you're not going anywhere. You just, you sit there, you show up, you keep going. You are one moment away from seeing it for yourself. But that one moment might take five years, might take 10 years, might take 15, 20 years, but that moment is coming. So you can't stop. And, and I sold myself short and I stopped. And because I thought that moment was never coming. So mm-hmm. if I can go back and tell the kids and I talk to the kids that are younger, that are like your moment is coming, right? I don't know when, I can't tell you when, but it will come. I can guarantee that if you keep showing up, it will come and you will look back and you'll be more grateful for how long it took than how fast you really wanted it. And that that's the real gift. And, you know, I used to think I never was going to have that moment, but my moment was when I passed my first assignment, I was 18. Their moment whenever it's coming but you have to keep going because if you don't, then you stop and then you never get to that moment. If you run away, if you give up, if you start making bad choices, that moment you'll, you'll, you'll stay, you'll be lost in time right there. You'll never go any further, but if you can keep showing up and you keep going that moment, you'll get to that moment and then it will all be worth it. The hard, all those days that like you hated and it was hard and when you were angry and you, just, you were lost, like it will be so clear. It will be so, you will be like, I needed it to be this long. I needed everything that happened to me. And now I'm here. And now it's time to make up for lost time. And I'm going to do it. And then that's it. And I know, I know it, I know it. And I feel like I have like this. I remember when I was an advisor and I was like, I am not going to die one day. Cause I always think about this. Like, I'm not going to die. Like I always think when I'm like a 95, <laughs> I'm not laying there saying I didn't go for everything. And I was selling insurance, right? And I remember like selling every day, just cold calling, selling insurance. So I'm like, this is not, I'm like, I don't even know what, why, like, this is (laughs) not what I'm, I'm not dying. All I did was sell insurance. I got, I got, I got to make sure kids get to the point that I got to. This is, this is nuts. So I remember, I'm like, I am not going to let, you know, these kids not get to that moment. And that's, what's important to me. Like, I want them to know it. I, I can't make you get to that moment, but I want to give you the hope to show up, you know, one more time, one more time, one more time, one more time, just so you know, you're, you don't know you know, it's like that last chip, you know, that last, that last hit is going to be the hit. Or like when you're starting a lawnmower, that last pull, it starts, you know, like I, I started many lawnmowers, you know, and I would pull for like 50 times pouring sweat. Like I want to smash the lawnmower. I just give it and all of a sudden it starts and like, boom, we're, we're ready. And everything goes away. Way, right but those 50 times like you felt kind of good you know you needed it so i just know they keep pulling they keep pulling it's going to start the engine and it's going to happen so that's 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 my advice to my second graders and everyone else you know wherever and, and you could be 40 years old right now and you still didn't get there right but you got to keep going it's not over you know right it's it's, it's coming so uh and, and i believe for you're 40 and it didn't your, your wind up is huge you're going to take off so get ready it's, it's going to be good I believe that too. It's like the meme of like, you know, the guy who's like the miner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that, yeah. And he's right by that treasure and he's like, screw this. I'm yeah. leaving. Right? It's 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 that. Oh my God. And just like Dr. Wayne Dyer, he says like, don't die with the music inside of you. Right, is, right. You're, you you're, you're, in, you're incredible, Jordan. Like I adore you. God bless your wife, your kids. Your amazing mom, which I am going to meet her one day. We are we're going to do um we're going to do a meet and greet with your mom because she yeah yeah we'll do it yeah I'd love to I'd love I'd love to meet her especially that like she's my country cousin we have similar oh yeah <laughs> background um so where in the world can people find you and connect with you and um how they can get a copy of your book as well. They can get, so they can get me on, um, they can get me on, um, Instagram. I'm just kidding with an IEP. They can get me on TikTok. I'm just kidding with an IEP or just Jordan Toma. They get me on Facebook. I'm just a kid with an IEP LLC, my Facebook page. If you want to order my book, it's on Amazon, but right now it's sold out. 
So it's sold out on Amazon, which is insane. But the thing is, Amazon, amazing, amazing. Amazon like has like this thing where they like project how many books you're gonna sell, and they always get it wrong with me because they don't think anyone's gonna buy my book. So they stock a certain amount, and then and they run out all the time. So right now, but you could still order it. They're restocking now, and then you're just gonna listen. They'll ship it as soon as they come in. So mm -hmm. um. But but you can just Google the book too. It's all over. You can get them on like if you want like like anywhere. Like just Google it. But Amazon's where you can get it quick, and um, and that's it. I'm just traveling the country. I'm all over the place. I'm going to Wisconsin next. Got two schools there. Then I come back and I'm going to Illinois. I have I think I have seven schools in five days or oh eight God. schools in five days. I have three in one day, six, three in one day, and I'm driving all over the place, going to these schools, and then um, and then I come back and I go to Nebraska, Valentine, Nebraska, which is very far, and then I got I got doing one in Brooklyn over in Dacca Heights. Mm, um, that's twenty minutes Dacca away Heights. from me. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and I'm doing actually doing the Columbus Day Parade there. Um, there's a big parade in Brooklyn. I'm doing. I'm going. I'm, I'm going to be in a, in a convertible and I'm throwing out shirts in my book. I'm running around, be fun, just promoting the event. So <laughs> that's awesome. That's <laughs> that's brilliant. I love, I love that. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for what you do. And all, like seven schools in one day, or did you find seven schools in one day? Or seven five schools. Days? No, seven, seven. I'm doing three, three on Monday. Yep. And then I get a break and then I do another two and then I do three. So like I'm doing the most I can do is three because then my voice dies out. So I gotta, no, absolutely. I, gotta come back. I know I speak all day too, but I'll tell you, you touch one person's heart it's the tr it's it's literally the most beautiful butterfly effect so so many students you are you are the catalyst of helping awaken their magic so thank you for helping awaken mine today and for our audience our listeners our viewers um thank you again it's a it's it's an honor you know thank you so, thank you, thank you so for nice. having me oh a pleasure a pleasure all the best to you lots of luck and um, I look forward to connecting again with you soon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.